give him honor in this place. Open up your mouth and tell him something. Come on, open up your mouth and tell him something. God, we are honest. We await your word, God. We await to hear from you, God. We declare, God, you reign and you rule. On heaven and on earth, God, we give you all honor. Come on, give him some glory in your lips, come on. Stand for the reading of the scripture. The scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. It's been read, but I'd like to read it again. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Pray with me, if you will, on a topic, the least of these. O oh, gracious, eternal God, my heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be used by you. I stand here, O oh God, as your empty vessel, O oh God, a little scarred, a little scratched, O oh God. But I ask that you restore me, O oh God. Clean me up, O oh God. Fill me and use me for your glory, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. When I was asked to preach this time, Reverend Mel usually gives us some time to prepare I went to the lectionary because I usually try to preach from the lectionary. And I saw the New Testament scripture, the Old Testament scripture. I saw the scripture from the epistles. And I let that ruminate for a while. I let that simmer for a while before uh, the Spirit directed me as to which scripture that I should preach. And so my attention was directed to this gospel of Matthew. And I still let that simmer in my spirit for a while. I was led to a, a, a different text. And as it turned out, I studied that text and started preparing that text. But God let that text preach to me. God healed something in me that needed to be addressed before I could go back to Matthew. So a, a few weeks ago, I was speaking with uh, Minister Bibbins. We were buying cookies <laughs> at the uh, children's bake sale. 
And he said, uh, bring in the word on the 26th, right? Or something of that nature. And I said, yes, I am. He says, are you ready? And I said, well, I have it in my head and in my heart, but I haven't committed it yet to paper. And he says, oh, I know it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be all right. So I was very busy. Some, some things uh, happened to disrupt our lives <laughs> from the time of that conversation. And I didn't have a chance to put that, put that sermon on paper. And so when I did put the sermon on paper, uh, I prepared like I usually do. I referenced my commentaries and I read the scripture several different times and uh, prepared my Holy Ghost inspired lectures <laughs> like I do. And I was going to go back and fill in the details. Well, I didn't have time to really put that sermon on paper until the the 20th. And lo and behold, as soon as I finished putting the last sentence of that draft in the computer, the computer crashed. <laughs> along with my well prepared Holy Ghost inspired <laughs> And so, Jim, you know my husband, Jim, is a techie, right? So my husband, Jim, tried to revive that thing. I mean, he put a lot of effort into trying to restore the machine and retrieve my files. And he worked on it for three days straight. He didn't even get, well, you know he doesn't sleep anyway. But he got even less sleep trying to work on my computer. And so on Thanksgiving morning, we decided, well, this is dead, and we pronounced her dead, yeah. <laughs> along with the sermon that was in there. Wow. And so I said, I'm not going to let this ruin my holiday. And so I took myself off to my daughter's uh, house. She prepares a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration every year, and that's my family sitting back there. I had to acknowledge them. But she prepared a, a, a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration. And I had a good time enjoying myself at my daughter's house. And I said, well, I'm going to get up on Friday morning, and I'm going to reconstruct this sermon. Well, when I sat down uh, after my devotional, after my quiet time, it occurred to me that the sermon, the well-prepared Holy Ghost-inspired lecture, was not what I was supposed to preach. And so I sat there, and I said, well, Lord, what am I supposed to do? So I read the scripture a few times, and the scripture was talking about the least of these. And I said, well, Jesus, sometimes I feel like the least of these. Who's going to minister to me? And I heard a voice say, I will. I will minister to you. And I said, well, how am I going to do this? I have one day, really, to prepare this, this sermon. And I waited. And it came to me, a song came to me, a song by Eldon Slaughter, Beverly. It said, what's that you have in your hand, Lori? What's that you have in your spirit? What's that you have in your heart? Use that to prepare this sermon. And so I, I sat there a while, and I was thinking, well, what is it that's deeply embedded in your spirit? Yeah. I keep poems in my spirit. I keep music in my spirit. I keep scripture in my spirit, and I use the theology of those things to govern everything I do. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Well, for me... 
those seasons are marked not only by scripture, because I use scripture as my conceptual framework. If it doesn't fit under the umbrella of scripture, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do it. But also, I embed music. For every season, there's a song. Maybe you do this yourself. When uh, something occurs in your life, you think about the music that's playing all around you, maybe in close proximity to you, or something that uh, you heard. And you associate that song with the event. And so when that song plays, you call up that event in living color, don't you? Yeah. With the emotions and everything else. And I also am a fan of poetry. And back in the day, when I was really studying African American poetry, some of those poems spoke theology to me and, and, and gave me a message. And so when I look at what's deeply embedded in my spirit, Reverend Mel, there's music and there's poetry and there's scripture and there's scenarios and everything that goes along with that. So when I was sitting there, and asking exactly what am I supposed to write, God? God brought us some songs to my heart and some poems to my memory and gave me some scenarios to share with you about how Jesus ministered to the least of some of his brothers and sisters. And so I want to share what the Spirit laid in my heart with you this morning about what Jesus does for the least, the last, and the lost. So the first scenario is um, you can't hide the truth from Jesus. Well, during the Harlem Renaissance, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a poet by the name of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Yeah. But during the Harlem Renaissance, he wrote a poem entitled, We Wear the Mask. Yeah. And it starts out by saying, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. And he continues, we smile, but oh great Christ, how our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. Well, when I think about uh, Jesus' interaction with the least, the last, and the lost in light of this poem, I can't help but think about the Samaritan woman at the well. And the story is told in John, 4th chapter, verses 4 through 26. You can read it when you get home. But let me summarize right now. Jesus was always traveling. He didn't sit on a throne and make the people come to him. He was always out there among the people, traveling among the least, the last, and the lost. And because Jesus is fully divine and fully human, he got thirsty from time to time. And so at one point in his journey, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Now, if you know anything about Samaria, there was some animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. But Jesus had to pass through Samaria. And in doing so, he passed through a little town called Sychar. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus had been traveling all morning. He was tired from his journey. And so he sat down beside the well. And it was around noon. So soon a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. And Jesus asked her to give him a drink. Well, she grew suspicious of that. Here's this man talking to me. In my culture, she thought, and I'm going to be uh, invoking my sanctified imagination when I tell you these stories. But she probably thought that men don't talk to women. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't associate with Samaritans, and women are generally treated 
as inferior. And so she asked, well, how can you give me a drink? Or how can you ask me for a drink? So Jesus explained it to her. And I'm paraphrasing here in today's lingua. The woman might have said, let's say the tables were turned. Let's and Jesus said, let's assume that I was sent by God. And let's assume you knew who I am. Under those circumstances, if you asked me for a drink, I would have given you a drink without any question. But it would have been a drink of living water. The woman was a bit confused. Living water? Well, where can I get this living water? You don't even have anything to draw with from the well, and the well is deep. Well, taking off his mask and revealing his divine nature, Jesus cleared up a few things for this woman. He might have said that something like, I'm not talking about water from a physical well. Whoever drinks that kind of water is just going to get thirsty again. No, I'm talking about a different kind of water where people drink the water I give and they never get thirsty again. The water I give quenches your spirit. When you drink of it, something happens to you on the inside because it becomes a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Right. Right. It took her a minute to wrap her mind around all that Jesus was saying, and she understood the logic in it, but she still failed to see the bigger picture. Uh, I know that some of you are, are bent on the, the minutia, and I'm going to use it, that's a term I use with my husband a lot. But sometimes you have to see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. That's because she couldn't see partially because she was wearing a mask, thinking that she could hide her true self from Jesus and from those around her. Mm -hmm. So Jesus looked at her. He says, well, go tell your husband about it and then come back. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, I have no husband. She admitted, and she was probably a little bit embarrassed about it. You see, Jesus could see behind that mask she was wearing. It was a mask of respectability. But think about it. Here she comes to a public well at noon. High noon. I don't, ever, I don't know if you've ever been in a region like that at high noon, but it's hot. It's very hot. She might have come to that well to draw water with the other women in the morning. But she waited until noon. She waited until there was no one around. Was she trying to hide something? Was she trying to avoid the other women? Was she trying to avoid facing their scorn? Was she ashamed because she had been drifting out of a number of shallow relationships with men in her life and she didn't want to be subject to more open gossip? Well, Jesus saw past her mask. You know, the mask that grins and lies. He saw her for who she was. He spied beneath the surface and saw that although she was not adhering strictly to the laws of Abraham, whom she professed to follow, she had a deep desire to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and Jesus told her about it. And that's when I thought about Marvin Sapp's song, The Theology of His Music. You see, Marvin Sapp might have put it this way, Jesus saw the best in her when everybody else around could only see the worst in her. He expressed his love for this woman who was among the least, the last, and the lost of her society. And in doing so, he quenched her thirst from the fountain of living water. You know, the fountain that is free to all. all right. The fountain with a, a heal, that comes from a healing stream. Yeah. The fountain that never runs dry. Uh -huh. Well, just as he was explaining things to her, the disciples came up. They didn't say much. But the woman left her jar and ran away. Did you hear what I said? She came to the well to draw water, yes. to quench the thirst of her family, but she left her jar there 
Because Jesus had given her living water. He had placed something in her spirit. And so she ran off to the town to tell the people about this man who knew all about her. And you know they followed her to the well. And Jesus told them that he was the Messiah. And many believed because of what this evangelist had said to them. He took off his mask so that she could see his divinity. She, he looked beyond her mask so that he could reveal some things in her spirit that she needed to, to deal with. And the mask of the people were taken off so that they could see that Jesus was the Messiah. That brings me to scenario two. Jesus sympathizes with our hardships. I'm thinking about the Syrophoenician woman described in Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Again, you can read it when you get home. But here again, we find Jesus traveling. He was out there among the downtrodden every day, healing the sick giving sight to the blind, making the lame walk, and casting out demons. Well, you can't keep that kind of activity secret. So word got out about what Jesus was doing among the people from all walks of life. And not all of them shared his heritage. You know, some of them were from different walks of life, from different ethnic backgrounds and different religious traditions. Some people would have looked at the Syrophoenician woman and said, well, you're not around, from around here, are you? But that was no impediment to Jesus. He typically welcomed everyone. But keep in mind now that Jesus had been traveling. Although Jesus was fully divine, he was also fully human, and he too needed to stop and rest from time to time. Mm-hmm. So on this particular day, when he entered this house entire, he really didn't want people to know about it. He needed some quiet time, some downtime. He wasn't up for company, so to speak. Well, at the same time, some people had been following him faithfully because they believed he could do miraculous things that they had heard about. One of these people was this mixed race woman, this Greek, born of Syrian and Phoenician descent. She was probably poor and had not lived an easy life. But she had heard about Jesus and followed what he had been doing. And she was determined to seek him out. Somebody told her that they had seen Jesus entering this house entire. And so she made it a mission to go in and see him as soon as possible. So she stepped out on her faith. She entered the house and fell at Jesus' feet, the scripture tells me. Now mind you, Jesus was tired, okay? He was trying to get some rest before the woman appeared. Then she started to make her appeal. Her little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit, and she wanted Jesus to cast out the demon from her child. I imagine it took a little convincing on her part. So when she saw Jesus looking at her without expression, and keep in mind that Jesus was tired, she probably wanted Jesus to know that life ain't been no crystal stair for me, Jesus. I'm just coming to you because I need some help. If you put it in a modern context, she probably thought about that Langston Hughes poem. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor. But I've been climbing. And now my daughter is in trouble, Jesus. She's possessed by a demon. And I've been hearing about the miraculous things that you're doing, the good work that you're doing among the least, the last, and the lost. And I've been following you because I want you to cure my child. I know that you can feed me with the bread of life so she can be made whole. Well, at that point, as weary as Jesus was, he probably looked at her and said, 
first. Let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Mm -hmm. This woman was not going to be put off. She persisted. She might have said and replied something like, Lord, I know I'm not one of the chosen few, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Who could deny such faith? Jesus did it. From a distance, he rebuked the demon. Did you hear what I said? From a distance, yes. he rebuked the demon. And he didn't leave that house entire until that, that woman's child was cured. All he had to do was speak the word, and the child was made whole. Amen. Now, this poem and this scripture made me think about a song from Juanita Bynum. She's one of my favorites. And she sang a song called Heart's Desire. The prophet just sings, I'm running after you. You're watching over me. You're all I want. You're all I need. You are my heart's desire. You are everlasting joy, never-ending peace. With my arms open wide and you, I confide, Jesus. You are my heart's desire. And then Byron goes on to say, you are greater than the great, so much wiser than the wise, and you I find my hope, I find healing. Your love is deeper than the deep. Lord, you're strong when I'm weak. In you I can find. You're a place I can hide. You are my heart's desire. And so this woman ran after Jesus, stepping out on faith, and Jesus healed her child. That's what he did for the least, the last, and the lost in that scenario. And that brings me to scenario three. Jesus is amazing. What a wonder he is. This last uh, scenario just kind of blows my mind. For it comes from the greatest story ever told. And uh, it kind of evokes a poem by County Cullen. Yet do I marvel. I don't know if some of you are familiar with that poem from the Harlem Renaissance. Cullen, Cullen starts out by describing some of the paradoxes of earthly existence. He mentions that little moles that burrow beneath the ground are blind. He mentions that although humans are made in the image of God, they nevertheless are flesh and must die someday. Cullen mentions a few other things that seem to be contradictory, but which on closer examination convey a deeper meaning. And he ends this poem with the line, yet do I marvel at this curious thing to make a poet black and bid him sing. Although poets, black poets, were constricted by the rules of society at that time, they were singing. They had much to sing about because they had overcome. Yet do I marvel. This, this phrase applies to, to so many things pertaining to the Godhead, that is the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet do I marvel at this curious thing, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him will have everlasting life. Yeah. Yet do I marvel at this curious thing. Yes. That Jesus, who was fully divine and fully human, he was holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above all heavens. But he cared about me. He knows who I am. Desmond Pringle might have put it this way. Jesus cares all about the pain you're feeling. He's aware of the amount of stress you're dealing with. He's concerned about how we hurt, but he is touched by the pain. He's touched by the sorrow, touched by the things that hurt us the most. He's not a high priest who cannot feel our infirmities, 
Jesus is touched by what touches the least, the last, and the most. Nothing to him is too trivial. So I marvel at that. Yet do I marvel that God sent Jesus as a redeeming sacrifice for my sins. Yet do I marvel that Jesus demonstrated his love over and over again for me, a wretch like me, the least, the last, and the lost of members of his family. Yet do I marvel that Jesus suffered, bled, and died that I might be set free. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb, yet do I marvel that on the third day Jesus rose with all power in his hands. Yet do I marvel about this curious thing, that Jesus loves me, that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves a rich like me, for I am among the least, the last. And the lost. Yes. May God bless you, Richard. Yes.